The last shall be first. There are many stories in the annals of the saints of people who have made a great comeback after being a long way from grace. I can think of three right now, all very different from each other. One, about a century ago in America, he was essentially a cowboy. He had a terrible temper. And one day, he was reprimanded by his father. He became explosive. And he burnt all in the barn and disappeared. He went through life. He always got even. That was the phrase. But he was caught up with by divine grace. And rather like Thomas Merton, some time later, he went to the same monastery door, Gethsemane Abbey, and in humility asked if he could make up for his naughty life. Though he could just about read, but he wasn't educated, and he became a labourer. He used to dress in brown in those days and be given manual work a lot of the day while praying away in perpetual silence. The abbot knew about his fiery temper and like a good abbot he tried to form him. One day he took a big risk. He was being shaved by the said hot tempered brother. And in those days they had the old fashioned razors. And he was correcting him while being shaved. And he was observing his reactions. At one point, boiling point was reached and he was in serious danger. Rather than execute what he could, the brother eclipsed himself. Now, bit by bit, the abbot, working with the Holy Ghost, conquered him. And he became one of those hidden saints, which were known to be the case at La Trappe. If you want to see sanctity, look at the lay brothers, hidden. No one knows their heart. And it got to the point that people knew he was different. He had, for some reason, found himself a good way from the monastery helping one of the guest families and had to take care of this baby. And it was terribly, terribly wet and the baby could have caught pneumonia. Give me the child, I'll take care of him. And from a long distance, in the pouring, pouring stormy rain, he brought the child back to the guest house. And when he got back, people noticed that there wasn't a single drop of rain on his habit, on his beard, or on the child. He had got even with God. I make a jump in time to very close to each other actually in time and both with one thing in common. It's behind the iron curtain. And we don't know the half, the quarter of what happened behind the iron curtain just as we haven't a clue what's going behind, behind the um, bamboo curtain right now where our brother has been tortured left, right and centre. Well, there was this lady in her late twenties who was in the army, I think actually it was with the Polish army, I'm not quite sure, but it was certainly behind the Iron Curtain. 
And she one day woke up in hospital. And before her eyes, she saw this person with a round collar on. And because she was working for the authorities, she from her sick bed said immediately when she woke up, Oh, you know I can get you into trouble. My dear, we'll talk about that later on. What is your trouble? And she started to speak. The soldiers. She was a female amidst male soldiers. And I think you know what that might mean. And she was disgusted with herself. And as she put it, she wanted to vomit herself out. She didn't quite succeed and woke up in hospital. And he talked to her about another way to spend her life. And because by then she had nothing to lose, she listened to the good chaplain. Oh, he was, as it were, the man for the hour for he was also chaplain to a convent of nuns, which he knew very well. And when she was better, brought this young lady to them and said, I bring you a postulant. But first of all, we have to baptize her. She entered and conquered heaven. Another, around about the same time, happened in a very sad situation. It was after the death, through torture and whatnot, of a holy priest, an Eastern Orthodox, a Russian Orthodox priest, who was working clandestinely to distribute the Word of God. Home-made tracts, essentially. And his wife was part of it, because in the East, of course, the presbytera works hand in hand with the parish priest. And often the son or sons becomes a successor. That's how it works there. Well, eventually he was caught. He was an obvious target because he was a fervent priest and tortured, and eventually, I think, died in prison. Now, they were kind of curious. Who was behind this typing? So, because a lot of the machines belonged to the state anyway, they were able to trace the one who was typing these tracts to one typewriter in office which had one defect on one letter. And so, this young widow by then was called in to answer a few questions. And answering a few questions meant undergoing a few heavy treatments. And because she was not willing to talk about those that she was linked with, the treatment got more severe, and more severe, and more severe, until under one torture she was nearly cracking, and they were asking her, Why do you not speak? He would not let me, and she would open her mouth. So the torture continued. Nothing doing, she wouldn't open her mouth. She was taken down, and one of the executioners tried, because she could hardly move, to help her, help her back to her prison cell. And she, in her quasi non existence at that point, felt in this man there's still a spark of humanity and had the energy to say, as she was coming round, God bless you for this mercy. He was a hardened executioner, but something hit a chord. Eventually, they were discussing how to get the information out of her. And they had one torture which they knew to be pretty well always efficacious. The only thing is that it meant having two strong men to carry it out. And he had to be one of them. No! 
He wouldn't go through with it because something had been ignited in his virile soul. But what did he do against the other three? The language of the prison was only one. The one they understood and the one that might have an effect. He got out his pistol and started to shoot at the others, who immediately shot back. And she was hit in the crossfire, and so was he. She, by then, was on the floor, and her words were, I am dying. And he, in a bath of his own blood, had the energy to say, take me with you. She, dying, stretched out her faint hand and said one word, come, and she took him to heaven, the eleventh hour. We know not when he will come, my friends. And St. Paul, in the first epistle, warns us of this Sunday of Septuagesima, when we think about time passing, the countdown, about what matters and how relevant it is. How many right now, as we pray, are trying to score a goal on the football field? How many are trying to score more points in the final exam that they're preparing for? How many are doing many things on the outside of their soul, which will do them very little when it comes to the last moment? Makes me think of actually what I learned in class indirectly. I'll leave you with this illustration, it's the bit you'll remember. But attach it to a truth which doesn't go away. Look at the planet. It's in orbit. All the time, souls are coming out of it like a cloud, two per second somewhere. Now, what old Nick is doing is this. He's making sure, that despite the evidence, we're all zooming in to what is not of the essence. It's rather like this. Our school was an all-boys school, and all the teachers were brilliant. But because of that, there were one more eccentric than the other but we never forgot their lessons. And the physics master was teaching us about thermodynamics or something in one class and had this to say. Well, little one, imagine that you're sitting on the back of a lorry. Keep quiet, please. You're sitting on the back of a lorry, I say, with frictionless trousers. Keep quiet. And what happens when the lorry takes off? It actually then takes off and goes very quickly around the corner. What will happen? Anyone? Me on floor off, sir. Exactly. Now, can you put that in terms of physics? You'll be propelled. Exactly. Now, what is the force? Uh, yes, you'll be tangentially propelled. Now, that's what's happening all over the globe, my friends. Souls all over this planet are being tangentially propelled from their centre. Lots of time for what doesn't matter. One little bit. So next time you take on a hobby which takes your all, next time you take on a whole evening which takes your all, think. Quid hoc ad eternitatem. What this for eternity? I'll leave you with this, which I composed just before the final exams in theology in Bangor. We're trying to score, trying to score, ever trying to score.